We are inducing the things that happen during hypoxia in hyperoxy condition. How do we do that? We are doing repeated exposure to hyperoxygenation. Well, hello everyone, I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Today on The Empowering Neurologist, we're going to talk about strokes, a devastating uh, brain condition. We were uh, pleased that the incidence of strokes seemed to be declining, but in recent years, we're now seeing it increasing again for reasons that may in fact be clear. We'll talk about that at another time. But there is an emerging therapy for strokes called hyperbaric oxygen therapy, a treatment protocol that, uh, in fact, I have been involved with for decades. Now there's really much better validation in terms of the science that underlies why hyperbaric oxygen is a powerful therapy uh, as it relates to stroke. We're going to uh, explore a new paper that was just published by a Dr. Shai Afrati from Israel that shows how hyperbaric oxygen therapy actually induces the growth of new brain cells when it is uh, utilized in stroke patients. We'll be speaking with Dr. Afrati. Let me tell you a little bit more about him. Dr. Shai Afrati is founder and director of the world-leading Sagal Center for Hyperbaric Medicine and Research at the Shamir Medical Center in Israel, where he serves as director of research and development and head of nephrology. His research focuses on novel aspects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and brain rehabilitation. He is a professor at the Sackler School of Medicine and the Sagal School of Neuroscience in Tel Aviv University. Since 2008, he has served as chairman of the Israeli Society for Diving and Hyperbaric Oxygen Therapy. Uh, very excited to learn more about hyperbaric oxygen therapy and what is really defining the leading edge. Let's get right to our interview. Dr. Efrati, welcome to our program today. Thank you, it's a privilege. And you are speaking to us today from uh, Tel Aviv, or are you here in the States? I'm in Tel Aviv. I'm in Tel Aviv. And actually, today evening is, is the Independent Day in Israel. <laughs> oh, well, today, today is uh, my, our 36th wedding anniversary. So uh, <laughs> we'll leave that at, at, <laughs> as it were. Um, you, you put out a paper recently that was really quite fascinating. And what the paper described is the demonstrable effect of a treatment called hyperbaric oxygen uh, to actually turn on the growth of new brain cells. Who knew? And very exciting. Uh, I, you know, I, I read these papers and I'm overwhelmed at how incredibly powerful and meaningful they are. Uh, and yet, uh, generally, a society doesn't seem to take notice. We'll deal with that problem later on. But first, if you could tell us what exactly hyperbaric oxygen therapy, what is it all about? When we are speaking about hyperbaric medicine in general, is it means that we are dealing with changes in pressure and the air composition in a specific environment. And we are using that in order to gain some physiological effect. So actually, if we are speaking about hyperbaric in medicine in general, we can speak about the pressure per se, and we can use the pressure per se. The classical indication for that will be whether somebody have air emboli, the compression sickness because of diving. And with this regard, the pressure is the treatment. We are using the pressure in order to shrink the bubble that is stuck somewhere in our body. So this is, this is one indication. The other indication is that we are using the oxygen per se. And again, the classical indication for that can be, as an example, CO intoxication. We have CO bind to the hemoglobin. We want to compete with the oxygen. And in order to give more oxygen, it's not that I can come to a person and tell him, I want you to take three pills of oxygen per day. I can say that, but, but it doesn't work that way. Because oxygen is a gas. And if we want to give more oxygen, we need to compress more molecules per square. More will go to the lungs and from the lungs to the circulation and the tissue that we need. So, so that's the second, let's say, physiological indication. I assume that what most people who are hearing us now 
are interested in is, is the regenerative effect of hyperbaric, how we can use hyperbaric oxygen platform as a trigger for repair mechanism. And this is, this is the things that we are dealing now. And if we are speaking about repairing a damaged tissue, there is always a bottleneck why this tissue was not repaired by itself, because otherwise, you know, we get injury and we repair it. That's, that's the normal physiology. However, if that doesn't happen, it means that we have something that blocks it, something that prevents the body from doing what it knows best. And this is regeneration, repair. And, and the most common, let's say, bottleneck for this repair may be related to perfusion, to oxygen supply. Because if we have damage to blood vessel, especially small blood vessels that we cannot open with either stand or bypass it, then we don't have oxygen. If we, if we don't have oxygen, it's quite simple. We will not have the energy needed for anything we want to build up. Okay, we can occlude the blood flow to the hand and see what happened to the hand. So this can be one bottleneck. The second bottleneck can be related to a trigger. Okay, we need a trigger that can trigger the regenerative cascade. It doesn't happen by chance. We need a trigger for everything. If we are waking up in the morning, we need the trigger to get out of bed. If we don't have the trigger, we will stay in bed. Okay, so that's the second thing, the trigger. Uh, the third thing related to stem cells, and, and I assume that everybody who is listening to that program know what stem cells is. Stem cells are actually cells that can differentiate into the missing tissue. It's like a three-dimensional printer that we have in our body. Okay, Whoever created us didn't, didn't create this body for a day or two, but for a period of time. He, know, he knew that things will get wrong. The only thing he didn't know is what will went, will went wrong. So instead of giving us repair, he gave us this three-dimensional printer. He said, print, you have a problem in the skin, print the skin, you have a problem in the bone, prick a bone, etc., etc." And these are the stem cells. And the last thing is, is blood vessels. We need the access. We need access for the blood supplies, with the nutrition, with everything related to it. So those, those are the bottlenecks. And I think that that's quite clear to any, any physician or anybody who see a peripheral wound in the leg. Okay, Because once we are looking at the wound, we understand what's going on. But it becomes more challenging if we are speaking about the tissue that we have between our ears, which is actually the brain. Because... We are, it's not tangible. We don't see it. So we are not referring to the brain as a tissue. We are looking at it, you know, in a high-tech fashion. We are doing CT. We are doing MRI today with functional MRI, DTI. It's high-tech. We can refer to the brain, you know, cognitive function, memory, executive function, mental problem, okay? But at the end of the day, this is a tissue. And... When we started with this, something like 20 years ago, the basic claim was that the brain is a tissue. And surprise, surprise, the basic four elements that we spoke about that are crucial for any peripheral wounds that we may have in the leg or other part of our body are also crucial for the wounds that we have in the brain. And, and that's, that's a statement that it's quite simple. It's simple, but it's not so simple if you were in medical school, like both of us being in medical school. And, and the prospection, when I was in medical school, at least, I, I was taught that neurons cannot be regenerated, okay? So coming back to, to hyperbaric, and later on we can, we can discuss more about the obstacles that we have for hyperbaric, and the main obstacle is us, the physician. Uh, coming back to hyperbaric, we were thinking how we can overcome this bottleneck for wound repair. And the way we do it with hyperbaric, first of all, if we are speaking about oxygen, we can increase the amount of oxygen that we are delivering by increasing the pressure and the oxygen concentration in the environment. As we said before, more going through the lungs and from the lungs to the rest of the body. 
When we are in two atmospheres and above of oxygen, with 100% oxygen at two atta, the amount of the dissolved oxygen in the blood that we have is sufficient for all the energy demand of the body, meaning we don't need red blood cells. It means also that oxygen can be delivered by diffusion even to location when the red blood cells cannot go. So by that, we can overcome the first boundary. People don't know, but, but the brain is a unique tissue by the fact that at each time point, the brain is utilizing all the oxygen is but they're being delivered now when we are fully healthy and, and, and at a steady state. And since the body, the brain utilizes all the oxygen, it needs to differentiate where this oxygen will go. <laughs> So if I'm speaking with you, I probably have now more blood flow to the Broca area that is responsible for my speaking capabilities at the moment. If I'm moving the hand, more will go to the head, more will go to the head, left, leg, etc., etc. That's That's what we are doing in functional MRI. We ask the person to do something and we see where the blood flow is going. We can tell him, move your hand, this is the hand, this is the speaking. Think about your wife, now I can see your wife, okay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the, ox- the brain, by definition, is an, is an oxygen-deprived tissue. Needless to say, what happens if you have a wound or you have an injury and you are alert, okay? So the alertness will, will consume more. So most, if not all, brain injuries are, are being done under relative ischemic or hypoxic environment. So this is, this is one. The second so, thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so that's. Well, I just wanted we, to recap. I wanted to recap for our viewers. And yeah. Uh, again, so what you're applying here is oxygen at a higher percentage. Normally, the air we breathe is 21 percent oxygen. So you're giving a, a much higher percentage of oxygen, but in and of itself, that isn't very therapeutic. You have to drive that oxygen uh, in, as it were, under pressure. So that those are the two keys. And the only other variable is, again, how long the, is the treatment? And that, that depends, of course, on what you're treating. So you're oxygenating uh, tissues aggressively and even bypassing the requirement for red blood cells to carry that oxygen because now you're raising the oxygen levels in tissues like the spinal fluid and the synovial fluid and really throughout the body, even beyond what could be carried in the red blood cell. Absolutely right. So this is the first element. The second element is the trigger. We need to trigger regeneration. We need it to trigger the repair cascades of event. The most powerful trigger that we have in our body for regeneration is hypoxia, is lack of oxygen. Once the body senses hypoxia, it understands that there must be a damage and it activate all the regenerative cascade. And the regenerative cascade includes stem cell proliferation, migration, building up new blood vessels. That's been sensed at the cellular level. When we have hypoxia, then we have a transcriptor factor. We call it HIF, hypoxic induced factor. And when I'm saying transcriptor factor, once it's going up, there is a whole cascade of gene that will express. And these genes will be responsible for the regenerative capacity. However, hypoxia is not, is not healthy. If I will take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, he will really need the repair mechanism. Okay? So we were thinking, what's going on? Does the body sense absolute values or does the body sense the fluctuations? It happens to be there is no absolute in anything. Everything is relative. So if we are taking somebody to a certain amount of high oxygen level, and then we are doing a fast decline back to the normal, this decline from very high back to the normal is being interpreted at the cellular level as hypoxia. Even though we have extra oxygen, the body expresses as as a deficiency because of the fast decline. 
This is what we call the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. We are inducing the things that happen during epoxia in hyperoxic condition. How do we do that? We are doing repeated exposure to hyperoxygenation. For example, I can take somebody, put him in the chamber, compress the chamber with air, he will get the oxygen by mass, and then every 20 minutes I'm asking him to take the mask off. When he's with the mask, I'm increasing his blood oxygenation from 100 mercuries to 1500 at atmosphere. He's taking the mask off, he's back almost back to the normal. And this decline is being interpreted as hypoxia. HIF is going up. VGF is going up. VGF is, stands for vascular endothelial growth factor. Stem cell starts to proliferate and migrate. And by doing that, I have the stem cells, I have the generation of new blood vessels, and that's how I achieve the additional element that are crucial for the repair of the damaged tissue. I will make a pause over here. I hope that's not too complicated. No, not too complicated. And then let's get to step three. And step three is, is the stem cells. You know, when we're speaking about the brain, as said before, we used to think the neurons do not regenerate. I was taught in medical school that neurons cannot be regenerated. And surprise, surprise, to make a long story short, today we understand that we have stem cells in the brain, neuronal stem cells. The higher concentration of those stem cells is in the hippocampus. These cells proliferate, meaning replicate, and then they are doing migration to the other parts of the brain. And during the migration, they are doing also differentiation, meaning they take in the characteristic of, this, of the cells that they are replacing. And, and once you get that, it's mind-blowing, okay? It's, you understand that there is, that it's a tissue, it's repair. Take it forward. The, the brain that is speaking you, with you now, this tissue was not in medical school. It's a completely new tissue that speak with you at the moment. And, and those are the neuronal stem cells and those are the replication that, that going in. So that's step three. How do we induce that? With the fluctuation of the oxygen that we generate. The last thing. So, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. And the last thing is the building of, of the new blood vessels. Of course, we have this, we call it angiogenesis. Okay. Uh, so, again, we are inducing the trigger. Stem cells are up. You have the energy needed to build up the, the railroad or the access. And then for the first time in humans, we can demonstrate with the technology that we have today, and luckily we have high resolution perfusion MRI and DTI, we can demonstrate that actually there is neurogenesis and angiogenesis in the brain. And, and that's a whole new role game. Well, having said all that, I think that what our viewers would like to know, uh, those who've had a stroke or have a family member that's had a stroke, is how useful, how effective is this treatment in allowing more recovery for a stroke patient? What has been demonstrated? So let's understand the basic. The basic is that after each stroke, we have a range of of damage to the brain tissue. This range of injury on the extremity is necrosis. Necrosis means that the tissue is totally dead. And the totally dead tissue in the brain is being replaced with fluids, okay, with CSF. This totally dead tissue, when it's being replaced by fluids, cannot be repaired, not yet. <laughs> because we don't have the infrastructure on which the stem cells can migrate and rebuild the damaged tissue. There's nothing there. There's no access. So this is this totally dead tissue. We cannot help with that. However, in addition to this tissue, there is usually, not all the time, but there is usually a tissue that is damaged, but it's not fully dead. 
we have some infrastructure in them. And this is where we can help. We call it in different names. Some call it penumbra, hibernating, stump brain, metabolic dysfunction. It doesn't matter what the name is. We have a tissue, it's damaged, it's non-functioning. That's the tissue we can help. Whatever function, let's say clinical function, related to that tissue, that will be the improvement. For example, if I have necrosis in the hand and metabolic dysfunction in the leg, so I will improve my, my leg performance, but the hand, since it's in a totally necrotic area, will not improve. If it's related to cognitive, to BOCA, by doing that, we can also anticipate. And today with the functional MRI, perfusion MRI, and the SPECT, evaluation that we are doing before starting the treatment, we can actually predict in accuracy of more than 80% what will be the end results of the treatment. And that's very important because you need to set up the expectation with the patient. You know, you can tell him, I don't think that the head will move, but I think that your speaking will improve. Is it good enough for you? You can get the treatment. It's not good enough for you. Don't get the treatment. And, and, you know, I'm not a judge. Everybody has his perspective, what's important for him or less important for him. So to, to be clear, when an individual has a stroke, there is an area right dead center in that stroke that is gone. Uh, but surrounding, it's as if a bomb went off. People right near the center of the bomb were killed. But in the, in the neighborhoods around there, people may be injured, but they can recover. So they're functional but not functioning as yet. And it's this, what has been called the ischemic penumbra. Uh, these neurons that surround the outside of that stroke might well not function, but you're targeting those neurons with the oxygen such that they do come back online and that ultimately gives people better function. So that's, uh, that's really what you can promise people that the center part will not come back, but we, we can improve function by targeting this group of neurons that are ready to do their job, but they just need a little bit of encouragement. Absolutely. And, and we can demonstrate that, meaning prior to the treatment, when we are doing the evaluation. And if we don't see that area, then we don't treat. Okay. As long as we see this area, that's, that's where we treat. And if not, then not. And if the expectation from this potential beneficial area are not, let's say, meeting the expectation of the patient, then also there is no need, no need to treat. Several years ago, a study came out of Israel that demonstrated uh, in uh, hyperbaric patients after a stroke versus those, I think they were treated with sham procedure, uh, that the size of the lesion on CAT scan was significantly short, uh, smaller in those who received hyperbarics. Not sure if that was your study, but I remember that was very, very compelling, and it was in a major journal. Yeah, indeed. In this study, for the first time, we did a combination between metabolic imaging of the brain to the anatomical imaging. By doing that, we understand for the first time in a clear-cut fashion, because you can see it, what we are actually doing. And more than that, we are trying to simplify the way we look at the brain by, by translating the signals that we got from the images to a pattern that we are used to look when we are looking at peripheral wound. You know, we are demonstrating that by color. This is necrotic, this is metabolic dysfunction, this is fully function. And that, that also, you know, it's self-explanatory explanatory for the patient. He can look, he can see, okay? You can discuss with him. And I think that's, that's another very important element to set the expectation that the patient see, understand, know what he's going to, know if it's good enough for him. And if not, don't get into the treatment. Here in America, we know that Medicare actually approves hyperbaric oxygen therapy for 13 uh, different clinical situations, including uh, things like you mentioned, uh, carbon monoxide poisoning, also um, non-healing wounds, uh, and you, you mentioned diving injuries as well. So we know that there are certainly plenty of facilities that have hyperbaric chambers, and yet 
um, Medicare has not yet approved the use of hyperbaric oxygen therapy in the treatment of stroke. What is it going to take for them to recognize that ultimately this is the right thing to do from a healing perspective and also from a cost perspective as well? What's the roadblock in terms of shifting the mentality that this is a very, very powerful therapy? You know, what's probably the limitation today of this therapy, there is no IP, there is no intellectual property over oxygen. So actually there is no commercial company who wants to push it forward and have the resources to do it. You know, I'm, I'm working in a university hospital, I'm a professor at the Tel Aviv University, the medical school, the neuroscience school, and I'm doing, I'm doing science, I'm doing research, I'm doing medicine. I'm not dealing with regulation. So it's not part of my day job, you know, to go through the regulatory path and bring some, you know, claims about cost benefit and things like that. This is not me. I'm, I'm a physician. I'm a scientist. I'm a researcher. So I can do the research. I can do the science. But I, there's nobody who can pay for a regulatory company to take this and and push it through the FDA. And that's the usually process that happens. Uh, usually there is a commercial entity that wants to push it forward or somebody with interest wants to push it forward. And then he makes the claims to the FDA and push and prepare the, the requirements, whatever it is, cost beneficial and things like that. This is not me. <laughs> I'm not dealing with that. So I don't know. Great. I don't point. know how to answer you. Yeah. I, I <laughs> don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> We, we know that, um, you know, your, your results have been phenomenal over the years in terms of recovery from stroke. Uh, and, and I think you, you were very careful to uh, indicate that, you know, at, at times there will not be a, a dramatic recovery and that that's an interface with the patient and family um, that you have. You have your clinic, you're doing your work in Tel Aviv, but you've established an affiliation with a clinic here uh, just outside of Orlando, Florida, the Aviv uh, Clinic. And so you have an affiliation with them. Tell us about the Aviv Clinic. The Aviv Clinic actually takes, you know, in Israel, in our clinic, we are treating more than 350 patients per day, just to give a perspective of what's going on. Okay, wow. it's, it's, it's a big center. It's a big center. And a lot of people see what we are doing and want to utilize it uh, in other locations. Uh, Aviv Clinic is the team, the medical team in Aviv is taking all the know-how and the knowledge we generate in Israel and use it in Florida. It's near Orlando, the location called the Villages. And any Aviv Clinic have a multidisciplinary team Working, meaning we have the physician, trained physician who, who knows the physiology of everything we discuss now and more. You have physiotherapists that evaluate all the function objectively according to a certain program that, that we have. You have neuropsychologists who are dealing with the cognitive. You know, we're speaking about stroke. We usually speak about the motor function, but the way I look at it, cognitive decline is much worse than having physical limitation. And we tend to ignore that in stroke patient, unfortunately, but this is, this is a very, very important issue, the cognitive decline after, after stroke. So the team have neuropsychologists who, who know how to deal with the cognitive evaluation and things related to that. And any clinic, if it's affiliated to us, will have the capacity to do the brain imaging that we are doing in Tel Aviv meaning to look at the brain in a high resolution anatomy fashion to see the brain, MRI, DTI, it means that we can look at the fibers. Uh, it combined with the functional imaging together and any clinic like this have the ability to do the interpretation and the evaluation before. In addition to that, during the treatment, and I must emphasize that this is not magic, Wound repair take time. It's not that you're going one time to the chamber and that's it. Everything was cured. It, it doesn't work that way. Just like any wound in our body, it takes time to repair. Okay. Nobody expect 
a significant wound in the leg to repair in one day. It takes time. So we are speaking about 60, 60 daily sessions in which the people needs to go to the chamber. We call it the suites, okay, uh, for two hours every day, five days per week. And during that period of time where you have a high amount of stem cells, the metabolism is very high, the regenerative capacity is very high, we want to take advantage of this period of time by the neuropsychologists, the physiologists, the physiotherapists to guide more stem cells to specific area by giving specific stimulus based on what we see in the brain imaging. So when we are saying that the clinic is affiliated to us, it means that he has the clinic has everything they needed in order to get to that degree, that level of medical care with all the multidiscipline team, the imaging working together to get the maximum best results possible for specific individual. And, and that's critically important. Here you have these stem cells that are trying to differentiate. And when challenged by, when they are task challenged, as happens during the therapy, then they know what to do. Uh, let me shift gears with you for just a moment and talk about a, a uh, a tangential kind of idea, and that is vascular dementia. Dementia caused by, instead of a stroke, dementia caused by sort of a global compromise of blood flow, but with individual discrete, very tiny lesions. How effective have you observed hyperbarics to be as it relates to vascular dementia? So with regard to that, usually we must all recognize that usually when somebody have a full dementia, then it's probably too late. When we are looking at the brain, we already lost a significant amount of tissue, meaning we have lost a significant of tissue, means that we don't have the infrastructure on which we can build the blood vessels and the new new ones. So if somebody always said, if you want to treat your dementia, you have to treat 20 years early. Okay, when, when you're starting to see the damage. With regard to that, what we have done thus far, thus far we have done probably one of the most comprehensive studies ever done on what we call normal aging. We took people above the age of 65, healthy, normal for their age, didn't have a classical stroke. Most of them, of course, have the, the small lesions due to the atherosclerosis process that we all have in our body, but they're fully healthy. We took them, we randomized them into two groups, the treatment, the control, and we were able to demonstrate in this group that we can generate new blood vessels, generate new neurons, improve their cognitive function, not slowing the decline, but improving the cognitive function. And this cohort of normal aging, of course, we didn't look only on the brain. And, and happily, the things that happen in the brain happen in other parts of the body, okay? Soon, there's going to be a study of us going to be published on, we look at the heart, and we see that the same blood vessels that generate in the brain happen also in the heart, generate in the heart. We see that the same angiogenesis that we have in the brain, in the heart, happen also in the other important tissue that we have in our body, which is, which is penis. You know, erection is blood flow. Small blood vessels, if, if they are occluded, we don't have good erection. So the same process over there. And we took skin biopsies to see the angiogenesis directly. And we can demonstrate in the skin biopsies the angiogenesis. So the main focus was on the brain, but surprisingly, it's, it's one body, okay? And the brain is just another tissue in our body, very important tissue. So we did it on normal aging. We pushed it forward on MCI. MCI stands for mild cognitive impairment. And we were able to demonstrate that we can also have improvement in that. It's not dementia, it's before dementia. And now we try to push the limits even further. We are running now a clinical study on what we call prodromal Alzheimer, meaning patient to have mild cognitive impairment. We can demonstrate in the brain by, by PET scan the amyloid in the brain. We see the ischemic lesion, the small ischemic lesion in the brain. And then we take them in 
and, and we try to see whether that stage wouldn't be too late. In my model of Alzheimer, of course, we can reverse anything, but you know, we are very good in mice and rats, but we need to see what happened in the humans. So at each time point, we try to push the boundaries a bit more to see whether we still, the, the process can still be reversible. But I can say it's quite obvious that if somebody has full dementia, full atrophy in the brain, meaning lost significant amount, that's not reversible. But if we are starting early, the indication the indication looks good. Well, that's really good to know. Uh, and you know, we live in a world where it's pretty much a, a situation that uh, there's nothing going to happen until you have full-fledged manifestation of a disease. For example, diabetes, nothing really done for you until such time as you become a full-on diabetic. And really similar with respect to Alzheimer's. The Alzheimer's drugs are, are approved for use or uh, tentatively approved for use in people with early stage, but using the word Alzheimer's. The notion of targeting somebody with mild cognitive impairment I think is still off the table as it relates to pharmaceuticals. And unfortunately, there is no discussion as it relates to people who are cognitively intact for whom we really need to offer up something. And in my world, that's really concentrating on their metabolism uh, so that they don't fall into the hole and begin having cognitive impairment. And from what you're telling us right now, uh, if we target patients early with respect to getting them in, on board with hyperbaric oxygen, that not only is your stabilization, but I think you indicate there can be some actual improvement in cognitive function. I want to I want to shift gears for just a moment. There's been utilization of hyperbaric oxygen therapy here uh, in America for things like autism and multiple sclerosis. Are you involved in any of that? I must say that that's when we spoke about what's holding off hyperbaric is that we need to treat, we can do clinical studies on everything, but when we are treating something, it needs to be evidence-based, okay? So that's okay to do clinical study on whatever you think is right, no matter what your expectation are or your philosophy or your theory is, because you can evaluate and see if it's working. So I'm not speaking about FDA approval, I'm, I'm speaking about doing things that are evidence-based. I must say that with regard to autism, there is one study that was done, but but there was no characteristic who who are the children that can benefit from that. Okay, well and said. autism, yeah, autism, you know, it's a range. Some have genetic problem. Some may have concussion when they were kids, and because of that, they have abnormality in the behavior that, you know, if it's happened to you before the age of three, we will call it autism, but if it's happened to you the same concussion after the age of 18, we will call it post-concussion syndrome. This is mechanical injury to the brain. If you have encephalitis and before the age of three with the consequence that continue after that, we will call it autism. If it's happened after the age of 80, we call it post-encephalitic, whatever the symptoms are, et cetera, et cetera. So actually, speaking about autism in general, that's... That's not the appropriate way I look at it. And a month from today, we're going to start a comprehensive study on autism, but the goal is first to categorize autistic children based on the biology that we see that causing the brain damage and not based on the symptoms. For example, if... Let's say I'm, I cannot walk straight, okay? I'm crumbling. I cannot walk straight. I will not go to the orthopedics surgeon and, and he will give me a diagnosis that I'm not walking straight, okay? He will say you have a broken leg, you have a broken spine, you have an injury in the spine, you have a problem in the muscle, but, but the diagnosis will not be you cannot walk straight. And actually today when we are saying that the child has autism, we are describing his behavior. Okay, so it's not it's not a physiological description. So I assume that part of this group of autistic children can benefit from the treatment, but not autism as autism. 
For example, uh, we have done a pilot on a certain mutation that is related to autism. So we took mice, we induced the mutation in the mice, mutation that causes children in children autism, and then we were working on the mice to see whether hyperbaric can help and in what way. And surprisingly, surprising to me, because this is the first DNA mutation that we see that hyperbaric can work on, we saw that the effect of hyperbaric were not eliminated because of this mutation. And still we saw in these mice, in addition to improve clinical function, we saw neurogenesis and angiogenesis and reduced inflammation in the brain. So the next step is that we, have in, we are developing biomarkers because you need to follow up. You need some markers that you need to see. And once we will have that ready, we will take it to the clinic and see if we can help with that. Okay, so the first step in, in approaching autism is to categorize them based on, on the, the pathophysiology, based on the injury that caused the symptoms. And then we can, you know, dig one, one cause out, evaluate, and then take the other one, evaluate, and then take the third one, evaluate, and see where and how we can help and in what protocol. You know, saying hyperbaric, it's a big word. It's a buzzword. But what is the protocol? You know, I'm so very, very happy to hear you um, take this apart the way you, you did. Uh, in, in Western countries, there's really a tendency, unfortunately, to target the symptoms. Uh, you know, if you have high blood pressure, take this drug it will lower your blood pressure, but it doesn't target why you have the high blood pressure. Why do you have high blood sugar? Well, this will lower your blood sugar if you take this drug, but it doesn't target the metabolic defect, the insulin resistance that you've developed, which can be targeted through other means like lifestyle. And, and I think that's very, very important as it deals with kind of the global term autism. And beyond that, um, you, you know, you're really validating the notion that when people talk about treating various problems, wherever, uh, the United States or elsewhere, it's, it's really fundamentally important that there's good science behind it, demonstrating that for that specific clinical entity, this has been demonstrated to be an effective uh, therapy in, in a variety of scientific uh, studies, uh, types of interventions to define exactly that that intervention is appropriate for that etiology. And yet, you know, uh, hyperbarics must be good. We'll, we'll use it for everything. And so really grateful that you defined it the way you did that, you know, there are going to be wider implications for hyperbarics, I think, clearly moving forward. But the bench work has to be done in the front end to make sure that we're doing the right thing and not hurting people. Exactly. And more than that, you need a professional to evaluate you. You know, I'm living in Israel, but but when I'm coming to the U.S., I see it's not even a clinic. I see people who are putting in the backyard some tube or sack full of air, and they're saying they have hyperbaric. And I see, you know, right. I even see my famous. face. Yeah, I saw my. I was in New York, in Manhattan. We are building now a clinic in Manhattan that hopefully will be ready. Uh, in a couple of months. So I was there and I'm walking down the street and I see my face <laughs> somewhere. I'm going in, I see sack full of air and they're saying we're giving a fatty protocol. I said, really? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's give a re bad reputation to, to the profession. Okay. And I know that, you know, everybody can do whatever he wants, but, but still people should be aware that this intervention, it's not the name hyperbaric. They need to go to a profession who have a professional equipment with the regulation, who can generate the fluctuation of the oxygen, the way we do it in the specific protocol. You know, it takes us years to optimize the protocol. And then you see a child taking a tube and sell it like, like a fatty protocol. You know, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I've been at conferences and visited with people that had those chambers and they would tell me, they'd say, well, you know, Dr. Perlmutter tell, uh, tells us this and that and the other. And I, I say, that's me. That's, and I never said that. <laughs> so it's, it's an interesting time. Well, I want to thank you for, for sharing your uh, wealth of knowledge with us today and really commend you for the, the work that you're doing because it's, it's really groundbreaking. And uh, we say iconoclastic because it's breaking down the notion the long-held notion that the brain cannot repair itself, and that is 
patently untrue. And uh, that's so exciting that you're doing the work. And, and um, we're excited that you're establishing these footholds here in America uh, at the Aviv Clinic uh, in the villages outside of Orlando. And also, it sounds like you've got one coming uh, in Manhattan as well. So looking forward to, to meeting with you and, and looking uh, at the work that you're doing. But thank you again for spending time with us today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure discussing with you. So this is a powerful, powerful therapy. As you know, there are decades of research underlying the value of hyperbaric oxygen therapy in stroke patients and certainly in other clinical applications as well. Now you all understand the science that underlies uh, how hyperbaric uh, works, why it is so effective, and one wonders why it's not being uh, more widely utilized uh, here in America. So thank you for joining me today on The Empowering Neurologist. I am Dr. David Perlmutter, and we will be back soon. Bye for now.